Uh, it's great to be here. It's always great to talk to fellow material enthusiasts, and I know that you are all that. And I want to talk about plastics and how we make them sustainable because it's a real, you know, it's a, it's a problem of our age. And of course, plastics are everywhere. We're not going to be living in a plastic free world anytime in the future. They're absolutely vital to us, they're vital to all buildings. You would have no electricity, no water, no windows, no furniture <laughs> without plastics. So how do we make them sustainable? Um, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our approach at, a, at UCL, where we've formed something called the Plastic Waste Innovation Hub. So just a little bit of history about plastics, because you know not everyone knows where they came from. It's, it's kind of an irony, given their environmental, uh, you know, the, the, the environmental peril of, of plastics now, that they were invented to solve an environmental crisis. So in the, in the 19th century, when the middle classes were getting rich in Europe and America, everyone wanted stuff. And the stuff they wanted were things like glasses, which didn't seem so, such, such an unreasonable thing to ask, but those were made out of tortoise shell. And so lots of tortoises were killed, People wanted pianos, so loads of elephants were killed for their ivory, and so on. And as people got richer, so these animals and their habitats were wiped out. So people, there was a competition to try and produce a synthetic version of these amazing materials, these shells and horns and tusks. And along came an amazing material called cellulite. And cellulite, or celluloid, you know, as it became, was... Um, an incredible sort of uh, material that, that somehow did, in, in, a, in a way, replace some of these materials. But it turned out that its, one, it's real advantage was it could be made transparent and flexible in a film. It quite quickly became the material of choice for photography, and personal photography um, became very popular. And because it was flexible, it could put into a roll, and so a new art form, a new visual way of telling stories was invented, and that's the cinema. And we call all that celluloid, that whole realm, which now completely uh, you know, is part of our culture, how we tell stories about ourselves. But then what happened was that people got much cleverer with the chemistry and could make hard plastics that could imitate wood, but they could do so in a way that was injection moldable and had a touch of modernity about the look and feel of them. And this came along just as electronics and radio were taking off. And so it made sense that plastics became the material of modernity. And, and radio and TV used this material to create what we think of as a sort of modern life. It's, you know, recording, you know, recording sound on plastic, it's, it's hard to underestimate how big a cultural change that propelled us into. Uh, and certainly, the kind of, you can't imagine that rock and roll and that feeling of being in your bedroom as a teenager, trying to seal yourself off from the world, as we all did, uh, would have been possible, or at least half enjoyable, without the record, without vinyl, another amazing plastic. It's actually per it's so perfect. And, and the, the human voice and all the instruments can be captured by just scratches on that material, which is all it is. So this is an incredible time. People got really enthusiastic, and in the end, created the amazing Chris Packet. Now, <laughs> I know what you're thinking, hold on a minute, that was an upward trajectory of plastic, and now that doesn't seem to fit the bill. But actually, the Chris Packet's an incredible invention as well. Um, before this, I don't know if you remember, you go to the swimming pool, you go to the vending machine after swimming, you put in the numbers for the crisps, they would fall to the ground, you'd get it out, and 50% of the time, it was soggy, these crisps were soggy. And the, and, and the crisp manufacturers realized this and thought, we need to create a plastic packaging that is really impermeable to, to water vapor, even in the British Isles, where it's damp all the time. And also has to be impermeable to oxygen, because otherwise they go rancid. And the way they have done that is to create a material with three layers. One is an aluminum layer on the inside, one's a polypropylene layer, and one's a polyethylene layer for the marketing and, and for all the colors. And that, mean, that means that the, the companies who make crisps can sell this all over the world, it can stay into a container, it can go anywhere, it can 12 months life. And that's incredible for their profitability. It also means that you and I, when you open a crisp packet these days, well, it's hardly ever stale, right? It's hardly ever. And so this is a perfect piece of packaging, except for one thing that no one thought of until this point, which was, what happens at the end of life? What happens to that crisp packet at the end of life? And 
here I am with a whole load of architects. And you can think of that crisp packet as all the other plastics that you uh, specify, right? All the liners and all the buildings, all the things that make things waterproof. They're all complex polymers with many different layers. That functionality is the same thing that the crisp manufacturer has done. That's a little building there, isn't it? It's a building for crisps. But it's actually, you know, that it's the same idea that all the plastics in this place and in your phone and all the wires coming through here, all the pipes, they're all really complex layered polymers. And that produces a problem for end of life. And the reason for that is a, is a piece of chemistry, which I'll just go through with you. So plastics come from oil, and you, you, they go into some sort of chemical engineering plant where, you, where essentially you take these long-chained carbon atoms and you split them up. And then if you do a nice piece of chemistry with them, you can create polymers. And polymers uh, are these long-chained uh, um, carbons, and they're, they're the solid versions. So the short chain ones, they're your fuels, right? There's petrol, gasoline, and all these other things, diesel. The longer chain ones become these polymers. If you, if you layer them up, you can get different properties. So you can get toughness, strength, you can get being able to color it. And that's, that's what's happening in this crisp manufacture. You turn a polymer, you layer it these different polymers, you get your packaging. And that then means you can make a crisp packet, and then you can have a lovely moment with your crisps. And then... <laughs> And then at the end of life, which isn't very soon after you start the crisps, let's face it, um, it gets collected. And here's the problem that people ignored for, for decades. It ends up in landfill did for, and, or in the sea. And this is, this is of course, a big problem. Uh, the reason that it doesn't get recycled is because in the polymer stage, you can see there's different polymers are layered, and that means that they can't be un, unmixed. So once they're mixed together, they can't be unmixed with any, with, with any real ease. And so it becomes unprofitable to take apart that crisp packet or the liner of your building or the wiring of your, of your electricity or your, or your phone and make a new polymer out of it. So how, what do we do? Should we give up crisps? <laughs> In a sense, it's a hard thing to do, but we could probably do it. But we can't give up complex polymers because they give us the performance of the buildings and they allow us to reduce CO2 emissions far more than the cost, you would argue, to the environment of the littering. But, but that doesn't seem a very acceptable solution. There must be something better than that. And here, here is the solution, and it's a, what's called a circular economy solution. So in this solution, you take the oil, you make your polymers, you make your plastic packaging, you make your crisp packet, you have the delicious crisp. <laughs> it's perfectly crisp because you've got the complex polymer. You then collect it, and then you do something called chemical recycling, which basically means that you, you take apart the polymer, carbon by carbon, and you reconstitute it. And that, that so-called chemical recycling exists as a technology, and we're working on different versions of it. And then the output of that is something that is like oil. It goes straight back into the chemical engineering plant. So you think, great, well, you've got it sorted. What's everyone worrying about? And the problem is this, that you can't have a sustainable solution that's not also an economic solution. At the moment, you get the oil, people pay for that. You get the polymers coming out, people pay for that. You get the, the plastic uh, uh, packaging, people will pay for that. You get the crisps, people will pay for that. <laughs> as soon as you've opened the crisp packet, you have to pay someone to take it away. You have to pay someone to collect it. And you have to pay someone to chemically recycle it. And that, the, the deficit, the red arrow, uh, pound signs there, mean that this is not economically viable at all. Now, there is really only one way to solve that. It's not the technical problem that is really holding us back. It's the economic problem. And what we have to do, essentially, is get rid of oil. We have to stop oil being put into the system. And I, I don't mean that just completely stop it. I mean, you have to sort of make it more expensive, because at the moment, cheap oil outpaces all the recycling. Every time oil prices go down, 20 recycling companies go out of business, because they just can't compete. Um, and this is not going to stop until cheap oil is either outlawed or we as a society agree that its economic, its environmental impact is too great. Now, you might say, well, we should just tax oil. <laughs> we should have a carbon tax. And I think I would agree with you. Because that then changes the economics of the whole circular system and means that it would be cheaper to take plastics out of buildings that have had their life or to take the crisp packets, it's the same thing, and chemically recycle them to get your carbon molecules rather than to pump it out of the ground. 
And that has to happen. Without that, you don't have a circular economy, and without that, you don't have a sustainable plastics industry. So, um, what do we do in the meantime? Because I don't think this is, gonna, this is not gonna happen overnight. I think as things get worse and worse and worse, so there'll be more political pressure to, to tax carbon, and there'll be more acceptance from society that we have to tax carbon, and then I think it will happen, and then all this, all this technology will come into play, and circular economy will start to go around. But in the meantime, you're, you're retrofitting buildings. <laughs> in the meantime, you're eating crisps. What should you do? <laughs> uh, so I thought I'd leave you with some, you know, my, my take on, on how to live in a complex world where it's not perfect and we're trying to do the right thing, but you can't overnight get there. So water, bottles of water, don't need them. <laughs> you really don't need them. Uh, and especially in buildings, like all buildings should be fit with, with, with portable water, easy and able to get hold of. Uh, Push back on your clients who want to have a cafe selling water. <laughs> At UCL, it's the biggest seller. We sell water to our students, but we could be giving it away. Why are we doing that? <laughs> Coffee cups, totally unnecessary. Very complex polymer, almost impossible to recycle economically. Utterly unnecessary. <laughs> but if you put a cafe into a building these days, almost everyone, um, the economic model is to use disposable cups because otherwise you have to allocate space for washing and you have to... Um, you have to stop people taking the cups away and not bringing them back. Th these are sort of gnarly things, but we can do something about them. I think in the fabric of, a, of an architecture, you can actually change people's behavior. Um, things like stretchy jeans <laughs> are much harder to change. 67% of all the clothing in this room is plastic. I know that because your trousers are not falling down. That's the elastic. But it's also the, the, the tightness of all the, you know, the fashion of liking tight clothes and, and, and close-knit clothes. We can't recycle any of it. It all goes into landfill. Should you buy it? So basically, if you're specifying things, try and specify things which have one polymer, because <laughs> then it is recyclable. Either, either cotton or, or, or nylon, but not mixes. That's a total disaster. Kettles, it's weird. Kettles don't last more than a year now and yet they're full of incredible polymers, and they just go into landfill. But if you specify hot water being delivered on site or you know, with a boiler, you completely lose that waste stream. So I guess I'll leave you with that. We don't have to go through all the things. <laughs> but to say I think that everyone here could make a difference in the, while politically activating for taxes on carbon. But everyone here has a, has a role to play, whether it's just simply giving up crisps <laughs> or making some of these choices about the way things are designed and cutting out the waste of complex polymers. Basically, if the thing is only going to last 10 or 20 minutes in your, in your company before it gets discarded, then you shouldn't be buying it. <laughs> you can put up with complex polymers when you have something like a building that's going to last 30 years, then the liner of that building should be complex, and that's great, um, but not, not a crisp packet or a toothbrush. So, uh, just to say that it's not, I'm representing a lot of people here, the team is very big and very diverse, and we have, you'll be happy to know, architects in it, <laughs> uh, as well as material scientists, chemists and biologists, and the only way to solve these problems is together, we've all got to decide that it's just not acceptable not to have a circular solution for plastics, and in fact, for all of the materials in all buildings. So, thank you, I hope you enjoy your dinner, and I hope I've given you food for thought.